What I love about the Stoics is that it's it's so much. It's not just about reading. It's about taking action and doing things and expecting, taking action, being a good person, being brave, being、uh, having vigor. I love Charleston.、Uh, I wrote my first book when I was living in New Orleans.、Uh, Charleston felt a little smaller.、Mm-hmm. And、uh, actually, we have.、Um, I met Matt Mullenweg, who's、yes. a, a buddy of yours. I met him because we were at a dinner party, and we both bonded over one of your books. And、uh, no way. Yes,、uh, and I I love that. And actually, Matt is in my book. I talk about the story about Matt told me this funny story about how he was、um, on a plane and a guy took off his shoes and the smell took human form and ran around the cabin. And so、yes. the、um, the stewardess took. Two bags of coffee beans, and told、yeah. this guy to stick his feet in the coffee beans. So I'm always like, never drink coffee on an airplane.、So. That's amazing. Well, you、yeah. know, one of my favorite passages in meditations is Marcus Aurelius clearly sitting next to someone with bo, and he's、mm-hmm. like trying to decide whether he should say something or whether he just has to put up with it. And I think about that like pretty much every time I'm on an airplane, and I just think like how. So much has changed, and then things are exactly the same. It's true. I have no sense of smell. I am completely anosomatic, and、um, my son plays hockey, and you never want to parent the smelly kid. And because I can't smell,、sure. uh, I figured, well, regular soaps and detergents aren't going to do it. So I went online and I found Gorilla Wash. Monkey cage cleaner, which is what <laughs> zoologists use to hose、sure. down their cage, and I figured, well, if it works for primates, it's probably going to work for my son's goalie equipment. And、uh, my husband and son said that、uh, the smell of monkey cage cleaner is actually worse than a nut cup, so it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have a terrible sense of smell too. I had to have two operations on my nose.、Uh, For various reasons over the years, and they just it screwed up my sense of smell, and I, I basically can I can only smell things if it's like turned up to eleven, basically. That's funny. There is the short straw of anosomatics or cacosmia, where everything smells like the worst thing in the world. I think、okay. be, because of I lost my sense of smell when I was in my thirties,、um, and. Having a bit of actor's training, I have a strong sense memory, so I can remember. Like if I say gasoline, I can now、yeah. experience gasoline.、Um, sure. But、uh, usually, when you're playing sensory roulette, most people say, "Oh yeah, I'll get rid of my sense of smell." But now that it's become more of an issue with the with COVID, it's been interesting how people are、right. saying. How do you how, know? How do you know exactly? Exactly. Um, well, where I live in in Austin, that we have this thing called cedar fever, and、uh, it's it's like it's this allergy from the cedar trees, and it it mimics the symptoms of COVID almost exactly. So it's a it's been a wonderful two years of like, wait, do I have it? Do I have it now? And then is it allergies? I guess I'll have to wait. And、uh, it's weird how the body plays tricks on us. It is, and that cedar smells so fantastic, and then you remember that it also. Is what people use in hamster cages, and then you can ruin it. <laughs> so, I think that、uh, so much about life is how we perceive.、Uh, this morning, I got up and I was reading a little bit of、um, Emerson, and、mm-hmm. I love how Emerson said, "Like nothing great in life ever occurred without enthusiasm," and. Uh, Jim Valvano, the baseball co-、uh, football basketball coach, is a big here and、uh, survive in advance, and he really gets into the Emersonian quote. And、uh, it's been very sweet、uh, having a son who is an athlete. How、uh, the transcendentalists and the Stoics have really inspired him. It's been really cool. So this morning, I told him, you know, my. 
within our family, we don't have any technology at the table, only philosophy books. And he has grown up with Daily Stoic and all of your books. And, and um, so he is he's just outside of Charleston. He's the captain of his crew team. And he sent me this really sweet note. And he was saying just, you know, write it on your heart that every day is the best day of the year. He who is rich, who owns the day. And that was a very sweet thing to get from us. Well, we're all very stoked. Well, I was thinking of you as I was preparing for this because I saw this meme and it was uh, it was like a picture of a of a father and a daughter in a blockbuster video and it said uh the year is 1998 your dad said you have snacks at home and your dad says you can pick out a couple of movies to watch uh over the weekend and then it says there is nothing wrong in the world. Uh, and that was my memory of Blank Check, which I think I probably got at a Hollywood video instead of a Blockbuster video, because that's what we had near my house. But it just very much called me back to a time in my life where I was thinking of absolutely nothing but like how many movies I could rent that weekend. That is so charming and deeply flattered, um, because when I first saw Blank Check and I was thinking, what is it about this movie? And then I realized that may be the worst movie I've ever seen in my life. And <laughs> I truly wouldn't watch it again if it was screening on my own corneas. And, uh, but the best thing, I, we filmed it in, in Austin. And, I know, I was just reading that. Yeah, and I fell in love with Austin and have very many good friends who are based there and uh, a lot of friends in the tech business. A ton were just there in, for South by Southwest. So... That's very funny. Uh, well, I'm sorry about that. I wish I could give you those 90 minutes back there, Ryan. <laughs> no, the good the good news about the movies that you see when you're a kid is going back to the this the no smell is you also don't have any taste, so you don't know whether <laughs> it's good or not. It's just whether it fulfills your fantasy or distracts you for a couple hours or, or whatever. I've seen that movie many times. <laughs> That's very funny, and again, I, I deeply apologize. <laughs> The only thing that strikes me about that movie is the somewhat weirdness of the kid falling in love with like that. There's a there's like a B plot of a of the man of the boy falling in love with a much older FBI agent. I'm not sure you could do that in a movie today. Thankfully, thankfully, no. And um, uh, it was it didn't really make a lot of sense, but uh, I, I had a. It was, I was talking to my husband the other day and he said, what is it about, about when you were doing movies? And I said, well, somebody has to make the bad ones. Like they're not all going to be lost in translation. They're not all going to be apocalypse. Now somebody has to make the bad ones. And I was okay with that. Back in the ancient world, philosophy wasn't abstract. It wasn't theoretical. It was designed to help you live the best life. In Stoicism 101, we have a two-week course that will introduce you into philosophy that will make you a better person. There's interviews with me, daily lessons that will challenge you to be better, give you new ways of thinking, tackling the problems of life, becoming your best self. As Marx really says, you could be good today, but instead you choose tomorrow. Epictetus says, how much longer are you going to wait to demand the best for yourself? Check out our new course, Stoicism 101 at dailystoic.com slash 101. Well, isn't that the Epictetus line that we're all actors in a play and we just have to do what the director tells us, basically? Exactly. Exactly. And um, it was interesting because at that time, uh, probably when you were about seven and watching Suffering Through... Uh, blank check. That's when I really just dove into meditations, and um, it's it's interesting that in life we have uh, you know our native uh, our ancestry, uh, and um, but we I believe we also have our native decade, and I, sure. that's I think where we become awake, and I think. Uh, in the 90s, it's where I learned to read myself a new brain and that I was just really motivated to 
I always believe it's never too late to get smarter or better. And it was uh, inspiring to dive into the Stoics, especially uh, Penguin Publishing used to have something called a, a, a 90p, and they were small little classics, and they okay. could fit in your pocket, and it was just masterful, and just getting to read all the classics and uh, diving back in. Um, so it's been it's been amazing um, because essentially education is free. What sure. we pay is attention, and so that's what you're willing to pay. And uh, I loved that education can somewhat be a meritocracy. It's what you put into it. And we often forget, I read this statistic that we often forget about 80% of what we learned the day before, unless you really make conscious efforts to make notes and follow up. And I feel like that's very, uh, illuminating. Well, you tell, you tell the story in the book. What is, what was your introduction to the Stokes? A friend just says, Hey, you should read Marcus Aurelius. How, how does this go? What, what's going on in your life that uh, you get, you get passed on to the Stoics? Well, it's interesting. I, um, uh, I had a very, I've had a really, I think I live life in somewhat of an, ex, an extremist where I've had very good things happen to me, one in a million great things and one in a million not so great things. And, sure. uh, you know, working, I was a recreational therapist. I grew up in a family where service was absolutely a part of the deal. Uh, Shirley Chisholm said, service is the rent we pay for our life on earth. And so I grew up in a family where we were had refugees and foster children, and we were always expected to do things. So I went on to college and got my degree as, rec as a recreational therapist and really working with high-risk recreation for people with disabilities. And essentially the philosophy of this profession is to focus on ability, not on what you can't do. Focus on what you can do. And when I graduated, I felt like I didn't want my education to end as I was entering the my professional life. So I guess sure. I'm just going to keep, you know, keep making a reading plan, which I think is so important. And you know, trying to read quickly and trying to memorize a quote a day that would somehow stick around in my brain. And uh, it was really, you know, when I was working on MTV, uh, I picked up meditations and have never put it down. And I love that uh, it was like the flipping of a switch. It, it just made so much sense. And then, uh, absolutely finding it, finding a whole new way to live. Yeah. What strikes me about the Stokes is how long that's been happening. Like at the beginning of meditations where Marcus is thanking uh, all his teachers and he thanks Rusticus for loaning him his copy of Epictetus from his own library. And you go, wow. Okay. So 20 centuries ago, somebody just gives this guy this book and it, a light goes on. The, the switch flips exactly as you said. And then yes. that's what happened to you. That's also what happened to me. Uh, hopefully that will happen to people who pick up your book because they know you from something. They never even heard of the Stoics. But that it's this sort of series of torches, you know, one lighting the other, lighting the other that just goes on forever. It's been so beautiful where you talk about Epictetus because it's also about, you know, the lamp that he had in front of his house that was yeah. stolen and about – not hanging on to things. Nathaniel Hawthorne said that education is not the filling of a bucket. It is the lighting of a lamp. And again, that torch metaphor, uh, it, I think is burning in all of us. And I think one of the beautiful things is how we often want to share and kindle this passion. I think what's so beautiful about 
philosophy and especially the Stoics, the practical Stoics like Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius, Zeno of Sintium, that Rufinus that we all want to share. And they were yeah. sharing. And there is such beauty in that. It's yeah, gorgeous. there's a pay it forward to stoicism it's not evangelism which you know is this idea that like you know you are obligated to save someone else it's more like this worked for me can i share it with you it's 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 magic and it's there's something so attractive um i believe uh that when you're passionate you want to share and that was and incredible when uh, my husband gave me a copy of Discourses and uh, that amplification of gratitude uh, for this writing that was 20 centuries ago and how it resonates with all of us. And that's what's so beautiful. And I, there's something that you're giving – with the gift of the daily stoic and the daily dad is that um, often the view is of well, philosophy is not for me, but it's for everyone. Yeah. And it's just a practical way to navigate the world. And it's joyful. Like, and I love that like some philosophers are absolutely right bonkers. Like uh, Diogenes the cynic who lived in yeah. a jar and said, you know, I'm like a dog. I bite rascals. And he was just a, a madman. I just love it. So, so the mid nineties, you're, you're reading the Stoics. Is this before or after the diagnosis that, that changes everything for you? So, um, well before and, uh, I was working at MTV, was working, uh, uh, sadly making the movie that you had to suffer through and working with Michael Moore on a show called TV Nation. And it was just such an amazing experience. Uh, and I was at an industry event and I had a headache and I normally don't get headaches. I think I'm more of a carrier. Like I give them and yeah. I had a headache and it just never went away. And I had no idea that it, where I am now, 25 years later, that it would be possible to live in chronic pain every single day. But I believe that there's a steadiness that the Stoics gave me um, that – understanding that uh, gratitude you know, is the greatest of all the virtues, but um, the parent of all others. And to find gratitude, uh, even though my illness had to reroute my entire life, my career, I'm no longer could be insured, um, you know, my fertility, my, my job, my, my physicality and losing, you know, feeling in my hands and feet. Some days I use a cane, some days not. Uh, I just felt like I can handle this. And I really believe that having a scaffolding of knowledge from the Stoics made a devastating catastrophic illness seem to be but something that – I wasn't so special when I was going to be able to deal with it. Did, was it a slow moving catastrophe or was it very, was it sort of quickly onset? Like you were, you were told this is how it's going to go get ready or has it been 25 years of sort of worsening symptoms and pain? It was like a Looney Tunes safe fell out a window and hit me and flattened me. And uh, I've been, essentially living with the safe that every morning when I wake up, I have to pick up that safe and then carry it with me all day. Um, so it hasn't, it, I don't know how it could get worse, but it hasn't gotten worse um, with managing chronic pain, but it was absolutely overnight. I woke up one day and felt like I was struck by lightning. And that was 
that was a challenge. Absolutely. And, and the double challenge of like, what is my life now? What do I do? How do I carry on? I imagine is the sort of, aside from the, the excruciating physical pain, the grieving of so many things that you couldn't do anymore also comes into play. Yeah, that's so wise. Yes, it's you have to kind of mourn for your old life and figure out a whole new life. And I'm deeply grateful that I was awake to the idea that, oh, I'll be able to work around this. And, um, and yeah, there are days when I am somewhat roped to my sofa like Gulliver and then other days where I'm really kind of high functioning and I'm able to be in my friend's house and talk to you. So there's, um, I'm grateful for every day and I do believe that chronic pain and happiness absolutely coexist. It, it, I think, you know, you, you can't have your happiness predicated on outside circumstances and you just have to find it where, where you are. But still, it's not the easiest thing in the world to have your happiness be independent or in spite of external things. So how do you, how do you actually do that? That seems like incredibly tough. Well, if I only worked on days that I felt good, I would never get anything done. So um, it's, I have to have a bit of compassion for myself and that I can't hold myself to the standards that I had when I was a non-disabled person. Um, I have to understand that, that there is, I have to have a, a sense of kindness and almost treat your, myself the way that I would for somebody who I loved outside of myself. And um, I really have, I'm, I'm just full of gratitude and really happy for my life. I, how lucky am I that this is my fifth book and I'm able to write where um, that doesn't take a lot. You know, I don't have to do stunts. I can sure. do, work from home and read the thing I love to do the most. So <clears throat> what, what turning to the Stoics then as, as your life gets turned upside down, as, as you're trying to find a way to sort of muddle through uh, some of those dark moments, particularly early on, what, what does Marcus teach you? I'm just curious. What, what do you, what do you find yourself drawn to in meditations uh, as you deal with chronic pain? Well, I as you pointed out, I love the beginning where yeah. he is thanking people. Gratitude. And I love that he thanks you, the gratitude and he, and he thanks his mother for her compassion and generosity and the fact that like Marcus Aurelius was trying to teach himself humility and he was sleeping on the floor until she was like, no, get up and get back to bed. Um, I love, um, I believe, you know, I think it was Cicero who said gratitude is uh, the parent of all the other virtues. But um, I think what is so resounding is how conversational it is when you read it and how it feels like across the millennia. I think Galileo said that books are entombed minds and the fact that we have this resource of these entombed minds that um, we can travel through the millennia and have these conversations. And I would I mean, my main man is Epictetus. I really dig Epictetus. Well, it's, it's interesting you'd like Epictetus, although also with Marcus, I mean, there's one reading of Marcus, uh, the historians suspect that he had some sort of chronic stomach pain. Obviously Epictetus, you know, walking with a limp from the, the sort of tragic accident where his leg is, it, it, not accident, the tragic uh, yes. uh, abuse where his leg is broken. Do, do you feel like the Stoics speak to chronic pain specifically? I believe that pain is a part of life and um, will never escape or will always experience pain. But I think what I love about the Stoics is the clarity that uh, 
about resilience and uh, always, you know, how long are you going to wait until you expect the best from yourself? Yeah. And uh, I just didn't want to put my life on pause. And 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 I expect the best from myself and squeeze as much fun out of life as I can. Yeah, although I, you know, I think some people when they meet, when they read Marcus Aurelius, they don't see him as someone having a lot of fun. Do you disagree? Well, I think the idea that journaling was so important to him, as he's dodging assassins, and um, the if you were a, a leader in the world. I think you get there because you understand people and humor is such a big part of life that, sure. yeah, I absolutely, you know, I think, you know, listen, there, uh, there was another Marcus, I forget, uh, Marcus Aurelius Agribus invented the first whoopee cushion and <laughs> he filled um, animal skins with air and then had a dinner party. And then his trick was that he would have the footmen servants just completely start lessening the air. So they were all on the, under the table. Um, yeah. So I think there are some good time Charlies in there. I believe that pretty much all the interesting radiant minds um, have a sense of self-deprecation and self-deprecation and humor. And uh, so maybe that's not what he's most known for. But I absolutely believe that he's had to have been a great storyteller and a great conversationalist. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about you, but my journal is not like filled with jokes. Like my journal is dealing with the stuff that I need help with, which is usually not having fun, right? Like mm -hmm. that, I got that covered, right? Like I need <laughs> the 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 journals for the serious shit. So it's, there's kind of a uh, a selection bias there that I think maybe sometimes people miss. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, in my journals and my notes, I love. Uh, I've got this guy who makes book journals, and he takes old copies of books and turns them into journals. And actually, no, I put in things that made me laugh so I can remember. I, that's, I work, I'm working things out, but I, I have some humor in there. Well, there's, there's one reading of Marcus Aurelius. It's a, it's a long, it's a long ago published academic paper, but that the argument was that, that Marcus Aurelius' uh, stomach ailment is so bad that he gets hooked on opium and that some of the more trippy passages in meditations come from, you know, what come from are, are somewhat opiate, uh, uh, opium induced. I don't know how much I buy that, but I've got to imagine one of the, the tricky parts of navigating chronic pain, is, and we're obviously seeing this play out over the country uh, as we look at the opioid epidemic. How do you deal with the management of pain, uh, sobriety? Uh, and uh, all of that kind of stuff. Like, how, how do you deal with, I imagine there are things you could do that would make uh, the pain, that would lessen the pain, but then also come at a very high cost. So as one manages chronic pain, how, how do you think about that? Thank you. That's a very thoughtful and compassionate question. I love that the word compassionate means suffering together. And yeah. uh so that is compassionate. You're absolutely right. Every day it is a, it is a choice. Um, I have to decide what I need to be game for. And yeah. uh, so there are certain medications that I take that turn me into Gomer Pyle in a gas leak. I am yeah. not, not, not what I think of at the best version of myself. Um, and uh, it's, it's something that I have to kind of build in to every day. And I think because I have to uh, almost take an account of what do I have on my schedule? How am I going to manage taking my prescribed medicines? And then how am I going to go and squeeze the best out of myself and the best out of this day? Um, it's interesting when you talk about Marcus Aurelius and his stomach ailment, because uh, 
in ancient Greece, poppy was um, it's the, where we get opium. Is was they made a tea, and it was called poppy juice, and they would often didn't know how to calibrate it. Um, yeah, but uh, um, it, possibly that some of those loopier um, passages may be a bit of the plant. I don't know, but it's a, it's yeah. an interesting question. I think historically it'd be very interesting to look back on that. That must be so challenging that you that you wake up and you have that choice every day. I mean, I suppose all days are choices, but you, you do say your favorite quote from Epictetus is the one about making beautiful choices. I, I suppose that's kind of an impossible choice that you're faced with every day. Uh, how, how, how much pain am I willing to tolerate? How much consciousness am I willing to dull? And that sort of tension between those two things must be it sometimes be totally excruciating. You know, I think I have a a nature that seems to be a little bit roll like roll with the punches, fly by the seat yeah. of my pants, and kind of make the best of it. I mean, our life is made of time, and you know, there is no part time, free time, downtime. It's me time. No. It's all time. And so I look at life almost as an actuarian. And uh, Oliver Berkman talks about how there's 4,000 weeks in our life. And I loved a passage that you had in Daily Dad. Like, we have kids for 18 summers. And yeah. I think find that to be beautiful, but the rest of my family finds me to be a bit morbid. And <laughs> perhaps... Um, I've always volunteered at a nursing home. Uh, when I was, when I finished college and was back, I was working at the nursing home that I volunteered at when I was 12. And I realized that the skill set I had working at a nursing home, uh, which was elocution, uh, how to speak clearly, how to use my body. Also, I'm more visible to an elderly person or to a sick person to our baby. Cause I'm high, I've got black hair, white skin, red lips. So I'm so I'm visible. And I thought, where else can I use these skills? And I was working at an Alzheimer's um, floor, a unit at a nursing home. And I thought, well, everyone's saying MTV is destroying attention span. So I bet you I'd be great at MTV. So I got my gig at MTV and I still kept working at the nursing home. And in the past 10 years, I've become a hospice, hospice chaplain. And wow. uh, I'm not practicing now because of the, uh, of, because of COVID, but I do believe all skills are transferable and uh, I'm deeply grateful for my experience my training as a hospice chaplain. And I also think that, um, you know, we memento mori, you know, we all must be prepared. And so it's been uh, not a excruciating. I think it's almost in a way been a gift that I'm able to live this. I never expected to have what I call, you know, I have this, these extra innings. This is my bonus. I've got a round on the house. How lucky I'm going to make as much, I'm going to make the most of it. It's been very I, good. I want to talk about Memento Mori at the end, but it does seem like you've had a lot of different lives, right? That uh, you have, your, your career and your life has had a lot of different chapters. And then, as you said, the skills are transferable. So what you learn or what you practice or the virtues that one calls out, you're able to apply to the other. And this is you know, sort of a parenting book or a, it's a unique kind of parenting book and then it's sort of letters to your son. What, what, is, what is both stoicism and this sort of grappling with chronic pain? How, how do you think that that's shaped how you approach being a parent? Well, it's interesting, Ryan, because I wrote this book, Wise Up, really thinking about Nicomachean ethics and Seneca's letters to a Stoic. So yeah. it was never, I never wrote it as a parenting book. I wrote it as 
as an epistolary because I thought this is a great way to express how much I love the gift of stoicism, but I, it was not, it was never a parenting book. It had never occurred to me until my publisher was like, this is a parenting book. And, um, so I used my son, uh, I asked him if I could address the letters to him and, uh, and he, and, he, and he said yes, and I, I, because my son, we have a great relation. He, I really enjoy a sense of humor, and I thought in writing letters where my son essentially stands in for the reader, I could have a lot more fun and fill it with bits of trivia and historical information that it just found fascinating. So it was really a way to write the most entertaining book that I was proud of. I am a bit of a magpie. I find bits of information and treasure them up. And then Me too. I, I, I could tell by, by um, reading all your books. Um, and that's what I love is that you know, like you've lit the fuse for so many people who their lives are going to be enhanced because of sharing the sharing of the knowledge, which is such a gift. Um, so thank you for that. Well, yeah, you, 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 you have a similar way of expressing it in the book that this idea that we don't control what happens, we control how we respond. I imagine, obviously you're having to model that for your family. Like you didn't choose this illness. You're having to choose how to live with it, but how, how, cause my kids are much younger than yours. How do you actually teach that to your kids? Right? Like how do you day to day sort of teach other than modeling, how have you tried to walk your kids through these Stoic principles? Um, probably one of the best things was the no technology at the table rule, only philosophy. And um, and my my son just had to give his chapel talk at his school uh, as a senior, and it was fantastic because he wrote. And presented a talk that he is now a budding Stoic. And I think having books available and sharing what we're passionate with our children is truly the way to, to model it. And um, I love that uh, he, you know, he said the other day, like, you know, you've got to make the, you know, you've got to play the hand you're dealt, make yeah. the best of what you have and take the rest as it comes. And I was like, wise words, young lad. Wise he words. was listening. He was listening. And that is so fantastic because, um, you know, I always think like the mom is always the worst role in a TV show, in a movie, it's always some saggy, naggy, like there's not yeah. a lot of mothers where you really, where you get to see that there's someone's not always chewing, chewing a hole in your shorts. But I was able yeah. to, you know, tell my son, like, it's, like in your teenage years, like it is expected that, you will find me a huge pain in the keister. And that yeah. is the direct job of testosterone. Okay, there are hormones swimming in your cojones that are going to make you think that I am a the biggest pain in the butt to ever come down the pike. And he's like, right. I don't see that happening. And I was like, the sound of me biting into a, a, a piece of toast will be repugnant. So I yeah. don't see it happening. But it did happen, and it wasn't a bite of toast. It was a corn cob that I, apparently I chomped into like sea biscuit. And I'm always telling them, like, dude, moms are so incredible that nature had to synthesize a chemical to break our bond so you don't live in my basement for the rest of your life. So <laughs> be aware. And that has been such a gift, the fact that we can, you know, like – we can talk about it and laugh about it and um, 
and, and, and knowing that I don't think we can take things so seriously and, uh, and I tend to not take it that seriously. Well, no, I, I love what you just did there because uh, obviously I think sometimes we forget because the Stoics are so, feel so modern that they were writing 2000 years ago. Right. And so the idea that they would have understood that there's a chemical that's operating in the relationship that's provoking certain reactions, it's likely to do X, Y, or Z. They wouldn't have known that. But I feel like 2000 years later, they, w- they would have certain like, like what you just did was you're like, okay, here's the situation that's likely to happen. Here's the, here's the, the, the cause of it. So let's understand it. We're still going to get frustrated with each other about the toast or the, or the, the, the corn, the corn on the cob. But because we understand it, because we've talked about it, we're not going to let it feel like the end of the world. We're not going to let it blow up into something bigger than it is. To me, that's what the Stoics are talking about when they talk about sort of using your reason rather than just your emotions. And I do like to think that if Marcus Aurelius or Epictetus or Seneca was around today, they would be incorporating these understandings uh, of these concepts into what they're doing. I read a thing from Adam Grant. He was like, the worst thing we do to parents is that we don't teach them any basic psychology or bio, like that they're just flying blind and they don't understand some of these forces that are operating just below the surface uh, that are affecting every part of this really difficult thing we're doing. Exactly. And uh, we were just, we just flew to Charleston and our plates were delayed and flying is more complicated. And, and I think the fact that, you know, Aristotle said it is expected that unexpected things will happen. And, you know, the problem is we don't expect problems. Well, I expect problems all the time because I am a walking biological complexity. And um, so while we were at the airport, there was a family that was blowing their top and the outside reaction as if they were the only people out of the 200 that were on this flight. And it was a really, the three of us, we just we, we had compassion for the, for everyone who had to deal with them. We, we also tried to have compassion for the people who were blowing up. But you, the fact that we understand that life will not be perfect, and I can I can accept that. And that was something that was really great to see my son take in this information, and also now being awake to the idea that unexpected things will happen. The problem is we don't expect problems. Yeah. And I, we, we, my wife and I were just doing this yesterday. We, we went to this drive-in zoo uh, down the street from, from our house. And, and so we, you know, we, we thought like our kids would have this amazing time and they did. But on the way back, my, my son who's five had just like a complete temper tantrum. He wanted to watch something on our phone and we said no. And he just had this complete meltdown. He's like screaming all this stuff. And, and, there was a part of me that's like, you know, you can't let your kid act that way. Why are you treating me like this? We just gave you everything you said you wanted. And then it was like, wait, when, when did we eat last? And then it's like, <laughs> you're obviously just hungry. And and so we sort of catch ourselves and we go, okay, like, obviously we don't have any food. So this is going to go on till we can get some food. But just the idea that like understanding like, okay, you're acting this way and I can react to the surface level behavior that I'm seeing or... I can understand and, and I could, you know, my, my parents would have just yelled at me about this, right? They would have tried to like crush the behavior and made me feel like I was doing something wrong by the way I was being, instead of just understanding that this is a five-year-old who has zero control of themselves and is actually just really hungry. And by the way, it's my fault because I didn't give him food on the schedule that we normally eat food, right? And I think this idea of sort of understanding what's going on beneath the surface with people is like one of my favorite parts of stoicism. Absolutely. And it's a gift that you give yourself, but it, but it also, it's a gift to others because when I'd like to be a good person when things aren't looking too good, like I'm really good in a catastrophe, which I think I, w- which is why I was drawn to becoming a chaplain and be, you know, being a part of, I'm a volunteer with the um, FEMA, the office of, of, 
uh, emergency management. And I like I think there are banana peels in front of us at all times. And statistically, a pandemic was predicted. We just never believe it's going to happen. And uh, I am a spectacularly optimistic catastrophist. I think things are going to go great until they don't. And then we're going to figure it out. And then we'll get back on being great again. And that is, um, and I think that's something that I was able to learn through reading and from experience. And what I love about the Stoics is that it's, it's so much, it's not just about reading, it's about taking action and doing things and expecting, taking action, being a good person, being brave, being, uh, having vigor. I love uh, like I do see humor and vigor in the Stoics. Like of course. I feel in a way that they are friends. <laughs> in a way, you know, I spend so much time with them. Sure. Good. No, I mean that's that's what's so incredible about what Marcus manages to do in meditations is that his life should be utterly incomprehensible and unrelatable to us. He's literally worshipped as a god. He's the most famous person in the world. He's the most powerful person in the world. Plus, he lived two thousand years ago in a society that had slaves and you know uh, cults and all these ridiculous things, right? And then somehow you pick up meditations and you're like, this is my guy. Like, th- we, I know exactly what he's talking about. And I think that's what art does, right? R- by getting very specific, you manage to become almost universal. But there is something incredible about it. Seneca, too. It feels like he's writing to you. Um, or Epictetus, it feels like he's calling you out instead of whoever it was in the lecture hall that he's speaking to in discourses. It, it, it's one of the most remarkable things I've ever come across in my life. It is this radiant intelligence and the fact, as the metaphor you used earlier, this torch has been carried and how lucky you are, how lucky we are that you read the book that changed your life and that has now put you on a path that will illuminate people for centuries to come. That's a real gift. So thank you for doing this. I mean, it's, I, it takes a lot out of you. I, I mean, I, it, this is, you are dedicated and I think that should really be honored. So thank you for thank this. You. I really well, appreciate so you, it. You, met, you mentioned Jim Volvano earlier and since it sounds like you get Daily Dad as well, the other email that I do, I, I can't get over that exchange he tells about his dad, that he tells his dad he wants to, to be a coach in uh, in Division One athletics. And his dad, you know, goes in the other room and it says, Jim, come in here. And he comes in there and he goes, you see that suitcase? And he goes, yeah. And he's like, my bags are packed to watch you play in the, or, you know, to watch you coach in the final four. Just this idea of being a fan. How, how have you thought about that with your son? It sounds like your son is very into hockey. How have you thought about being a fan, but also, you know, the, the, I guess it's a tension, right? Of being a fan, but also demanding, encouraging them to be their best. How, how do you think about that? What's, um, it's, it's an interesting because my husband and my son never met me when I was, sporty and active like when my feet and hand were like, you know, or I'm not constantly, uh, I can't have anything touch my neck. So they, do, they didn't know me when I was a ski instructor or when I was a runner or when, when I was a very active and, um, my son, uh, is, uh, just is a goalie, a hockey goalie. And, he just won the Northeast Elite Championship. It's a big, big moment. And he's been a goalie and playing hockey since he was four and playing in travel leagues since he was six. And um, one of the things that as a mom, I realized that I could, if I worried about him out, on the ice where he's on razor blades uh, on of skates 
and there's checking and they've got sticks and he is in the net and pucks are coming to him at a hundred miles an hour. If I worried about his safety, I would dissolve the joy that he gets from that. And so I really had to rely on a lot of stoic training like to, as Nicholas Nassim Taleb says, I had to domesticate my emotion of fear. I couldn't eradicate it. I had to domesticate it because I did not want to become the person that robbed him of the joy of what he loves the most. It's funny. So now he's the he's captain of the crew team and he's down here rowing and the season's over and it's fantastic. And I was saying goodbye when he's off to row. And I said, you know, there is a small part of me that is somewhat relieved, like, okay, you know, hockey's, hockey's done. He goes, oh, mom, my, people die much more in crew. <laughs> Just like, <laughs> people get hurt. And I was like, oh, I love you for that. Um, but when you mentioned the Valvano, sir, that speech and his father's like, my bag is packed. I, yes. I want to have my bag packed and be supportive. Um, but it's interesting because my husband's very sporty and I felt like a choice, like my Jack did not need two parents that were knew everything about the sport. So I was able sure. to somewhat you know, keep myself occupied, support him, but not know everything that's going on. And that was, that was something again, that I explained to him that, you know, you don't need two parents that are barking mad about hockey. You just need one who's like, eh, good. And I just, think that that just is sort great. of like l- let let them hear, let let them have this. It doesn't have to mm-hmm. be territory that you uh, muscle your way into and assert your sort of adult authority or superiority over. Yes, beautifully said. I just figured he didn't need my prying eyes at the rink all the time, or I, I, I've got to have him, I've got to equip equip him in the best way I can. And again, take the rest as it happens. Um, It's interesting because uh, my friend Bill's son is a D1 hockey coach at UConn. And that's been really beautiful seeing um, Luke Murray uh, coach UConn and seeing how proud the whole family is. It's been really great. Yeah. It's like, look, they're, they're going to get enough pressure from basically everyone else. How can you develop the restraint to be, to sort of let, to not be another voice, but then also sort of be the backstop that is the unfailing, unconditional support, no matter what happens. Yes. I think keeping my back, that has become a shorthand. You know, yeah. we, we talk a little bit um, in the book about Familect, and Familect are, are the nicknames that we call each other. It's the secret language that families have. And yeah. I love, love Bill Walton, the NBA legend. And um, he really opened up a way for our family. Because I, I was, I was pretty much trying to hide that I was sick to my kid all the time, and hiding chronic pain and sarcoidosis of the central nervous system is like trying to keep a beach ball underwater. It's always yeah. going to pop right back up. And when with I a read surprising Bill, amount of force, right, like a disruptive exactly. amount of sprays everywhere, goes in unpredictable directions. <laughs> Uh, doing the exact opposite of what I'm trying to do. Yes. I'm trying to suppress this. So I figured I, this is going to do a number on his developing brain. And um, But it was really through the grace of Bill Walton's amazing book, uh, Back from the Dead, where he talks about his life with chronic pain. I was like, ah, I can, I, so we, Bill Walton is in our pantheon of heroes. Like he had to tell his family, like he had to tell his wife, just stop walking. You are pushing air on me. And I never, I didn't know how to say that. Yeah. And now I can say it. And um, 
And that's, and that's what's so beautiful. And uh, I write a lot of handwritten letters, thank you letters. I've written letters to you in the past. Um, I never put a return address because it's not about reciprocity. It's just thanking people for, and uh, I have been doing this since I was a, a, a kid and then picked it up again when I was probably in my late 20s, early 30s. Every day I write a handwritten thank you to some random person in the world. And um, that- So gratitude's like a literal practice for you. It's not just like, I try to think about what I'm grateful for. You actually write it down every day. And I have special postcards that don't have any return address because I just want to say, hey, I appreciate that. You do a good job. And I like writing thank you notes. It doesn't take a lot, but I feel like uh, I can imagine that in the course of three decades, like just these, no, if they all came back to me, but I, that was not the point. It was a really just about sending a bit of grace into the world. And it's just a short, a small, tiny thing to do. But um, I really like it. And I like think about like, who am I going to thank now? Like, yeah, it could wow. be, you know, somebody who works at a hostess at a waitress or the lady who I saw on an architectural tour. Just good job. And I mean it. Well, that's what's so remarkable about that first uh, chapter of Meditations, which I, I had someone look, it's almost 10% of the book, like by word count, is that they would have never seen it. So it's so beautifully written and so kind and so all-encompassing, but Meditations was never published and a lot of them were dead. So one, it's the idea that gratitude is something you're doing for you also, right? That it's the writing down, the reminding that was powerful. But then I also wonder like, did Antoninus know what he meant to Marcus Aurelius? Like, did Marcus Aurelius also articulate to Sextus the philosopher or to his mother or to his brother while they were alive? Did he also manage to express that gratitude with the same comprehensiveness and clarity. I, 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 part of me suspects that maybe not, that it, the reason he was writing it is that he felt like he'd missed the window. I don't know. I could be just making that up. But it's an interesting point to ponder. And again, it's a great thought exercise because I am a demonstrative person and I deeply value the relationships that I have and tend them like a garden. And, um, I try and express what I admire about people and to them because, again, this may be one of the gifts of working uh, at a nursing home or as a chaplain. And at the end of life, I have had the gift to see many people at the end of their lives. And I've never heard anyone saying, oh, my gosh, it's hot. You know, like the devil's good. Like, it's always like, wow, this is beautiful. And I'm so grateful. And it's what I've heard as last words, it's always been about love and um, bearing witness to that has been a great opportunity to move forward. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's one of my favorite lines in, in and it's, I think it's, it's, it's one easy to sleep on, but he says at the beginning of, of meditations when he's, I think he's thinking sexist. He says that he learned from sex is to be free of passion, but full of love, uh, which again is not what you would think of when you think of Marcus Aurelius, but that he was striving to be full of love is to me just a whole other side of the Stoics that we don't think about very often. And that's what I, I think what it, it's, it's interesting because we interpret it and we take read the same material, but we take many different things out of it. And um, I really see so much of the radiant appreciation for every day where life was really hard in the golden age of Rome, which was only 40 years, 80% were enslaved people. And uh, 
it was not an easy time. The life expectancy was about half, and yet there is a gratitude for love. And I love this idea of decanting passions. Uh, the, I mean, one of the things that I really love about the ancients was the, the Greek idea of love was not the erotic, romanticized idea. They had many forms of love. They had self-love, uh, philatulia. They had brotherly love, Philadelphia, what love for everyone, agape, ludos, the playful love, and um, the idea that erotic love, which passionate romantic love seems to be what all the love songs and popular culture and film are um, speaking of, but there are so many definitions, and the fact that our measly alphabet of just 26 letters, and we put four of them together, L-O-V-E, yet it contains so much. And I find that just to be unbelievable that you know, we say, oh, I love Frank Sinatra. I love Charleston. Um, so that's what I love about Bill Walton, how he's always using the word love when he's calling a game. He's, I love bicycles. I love volcanoes. I love my life, my love, my wife, Lori. I love that about him. He uses love like a old master. Yeah. No, no, you're totally right. Well, look, I want to talk to you about Memento Mori real fast, but I did want to call out my, uh, my favorite part of your book is at the end, you have a letter where your son, your son writes a letter to you at the end of the book. Um, and he had uh, the Great Gatsby is one of my favorite novels, may, maybe my favorite. But he says, uh, "Remember little Pammy in the Great Gatsby. Neither did her mother, neither did her mother Daisy Buchanan. You are a much better literary mom." First off, that's such an incredible compliment uh, to you, and to me, it seems like if you could ask for success as, uh, uh, as a parent, that so, something like that is is exactly what you'd want to hear. But you're you're totally. It's just a, I just it struck me as such a great observation because you're right. The kid is never named in the novel. The parents live these preposterously self absorbed lives. You know, obsessing about this long lost love and going to parties and what other people think about them, and then you know, covering up the murder and all, all the stuff that happens <laughs> in the book. But never once do you hear Daisy. Uh, or her husband, or uh, uh, or Gatsby himself express even the slightest interest in this in this child. I, I just thought it was very. <laughs> your son has an eye. Yeah, I thought it was really funny. I also loved how we mentioned um, with my kid. I. I don't do a lot of social media, but uh, if I ever mention him. And when I was writing this book, I asked for his permission because in France, if you post a social media post of your, of your child, you can be brought to court and you can be sued and pay a $7,000 fine. And um, so I think that it's important to, at any stage, understand that, yes, your kid might be cute, you know, with the crack of his butt hanging out, but realize that that's forever and that I want to honor. So I really, I said, Jack, you know, can we use your nickname Lefty? And he said, no, no, I am proud of you. And Aww. I would like you to use my real name. And he's a quiet, humble man. Um, I read this interesting, but um, statistic, uh, and it, it, I don't know how scientific it is, but it said that uh, the average adolescent male speaks about 4,000 words a day, and the adolescent female speaks about 20,000 words a day. And um, so he's a man of few words, but um, I think, yeah, he can't be a gas bag like me. And um, it's been interesting to kind of draw this out of him and to be able to work on a project like this. And I was very Im impressed that he pulled out uh, the 
literary mothers that he had read about. And where did I rank? It's very good. Well, my, my last question for you, uh, and I was just thinking about this more uh, because uh, we, we went to the, the Austin Rodeo on Saturday and my kids won a goldfish that like ring <laughs> toss. And then uh, it, one of them died by Sunday night already because my son overfed it. And uh, <laughs> even though I told him several times this is exactly what was going to happen. So now we're already having uh, to have this little discussion about 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 their their pet dying and, and how the pet won't come back. How, how have you had to think about, you know, it's, it's one thing for the Stokes to say, Memento Mori, uh, you know, f- act as if death hangs over you, which it does in the loosest sense, but in your case, it, it sort of literally does. And, and Memento Mori isn't just a philosophical practice. I imagine it's somewhat, it's a crushing reality at times or an overwhelming uh uh, fact of your disease. Uh, t- talk, talk to me about Memento Mori and, and how stoicism has helped you, but the, and then how you've had to think about it as a parent. Well, I th- think because I have been, I've had last rites, and then I came <laughs> roaring back, and. I would, I would recommend not dying to practically everybody because it was really, really nice to not die. But um, I don't have that great fear. And I, um, I think that uh, having a – I don't think of myself as somebody with an incurable illness. I just think, oh, they didn't figure it out yet, but I, it's, it's interesting because my husband is super fit and is, and, 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 and a little bit more neurotic about death and maybe I'm barking mad and I, I don't fear it. And I tend to spit in death's eye. Um, I'm glad that my husband has a maybe more level view and I'm, I just realized at, at my son's school, there's a monument to a, a woman who went down on the Titanic. And her name was Edith Course Chase. She was only one of the four first class passengers who went down on the Titanic. And she gave her spot on the uh, lifeboat to a, a mother who had four children. And her monument says, Love is stronger than death. And that's what I believe. One of my best friends in the world has ALS. And um, we were diagnosed around the same time. And uh, actually, I I had a head start. I was a grizzled veteran by about 10 years. So she, she is dealing with ALS. And one of the things that she told her children was, a mother's love is eternal. And I love that. And um, I just feel that love is stronger than death, just like that monument notes. And so perhaps I do not fear death because I don't fear love. I embrace love and I believe it's eternal. And um, it is what puffs us up. My four chambered organ is pumping right now. My 40 trillion cells are thrumming right now. All I have is this moment. All I have is this day. And um, uh, and I'll take it. I can't imagine feeling any different um, about life or my life ending. And I've been close and I've had to prepare. One of the things as a chaplain is you, one of the exercises is you have to prepare your funeral. And um, that's a great thing to do. It's a good thing to think about because we often just kind of want to not think about, but you know, I've got the margarita machine. I've got the spooky Halloween sound effects record I want to play. I mean, I've got the fireworks. It's it's going to be a party. It's going to be called yeah, yeah Duff going out with a bang. <laughs> I love it. No, it's mm-hmm. um, it, it's uh, it's I, I think about this where like 
obviously you, you don't want to be, you, you would never want your life to be cut short. I, I'm sad when I have to go out of town or when I have to be gone all day or whatever. And I go like, you know, uh, that makes me sad. And then, then I catch myself, I'm at home and they want to play. And I'm like, no, sorry, I'm busy. Right. So it's, it's funny, like we want more time. Uh, but the irony, as Seneca points out, is when, then when we have the time, we don't actually spend it on the thing that we say we care about. Uh, carpe diem, carpe noctum. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, you know, like, why just the day? That's yeah. Carpe noctum as well. Seize it all. Yeah. Or sees right. It, it, it's like, forget the day. Why don't you just handle like these next two minutes in front of you and not waste them? It's, it's really interesting. Be, uh, I read a lot about like, like the Lancet and I've tried to read as much about biology and psychology and that the signal of pain lasts six seconds but it's just constantly what's happened with me is the lesion in my central nervous system grew so big and your skull is a contained environment that it destroyed the nerves um, on, in my uh, medulla and uh, cerebellum. And so this part of my brain, there's like a baseball size granuloma and Normally, your your cells are permeable, but sarcoidosis makes them like crystals. So they're like sugar. So they can't talk so, to each other and they're causing, it's crushed all the nerves. So as my brain is constantly keeping me alive and keeping me moving, it's also saying like, hey, there's a big problem here. So it's like this car alarm that's always going off. Like there's a big problem here and I can't get it to turn off. So- I figured if I get mad at this, I'll be mad all the time. So yeah. I should just, I have to accept what I have and make the most of what I have. And um, I have deep compassion for people. Um, what's interesting, the word pain comes from the Latin pona, which means punishment or penalty. So living with chronic pain is almost like being punished for a crime you didn't commit and sure. pain reduces language when you're in pain you can't talk you're just like Urgh. yeah it turns you and into an idiot exactly well it actually a true idiot in ancient greek was a free person who didn't vote in a democratic election <laughs> so i like that the idiot is not a, per is a person yeah. who doesn't vote um idiotis but um yes it does and um it can turn you into an object of pity or, um, and uh, I just recognize that pain reduces language and that writing and talking to the world through books has been such a gift. And I think I'm much more eloquent out of my left hand than I am out of my pie hole. So it, 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 it worked out for me. I'm grateful. Well, Karen, I'm very grateful for the book. It was beautiful and thoughtful, and uh, it's a fun read. And uh, I'm so glad we got to we got to talk. And I don't know if uh, in 1997 or eight, when I was watching Blank Check, this is where I thought we'd both end up. But here, here we are. It worked out uh, as was fated, the Stokes would say. And uh, I'm so glad we connected. But uh, I hope you have a good day. And uh, tell Bill I'm, uh, of course, a huge fan. And uh, Tell your son, I, All right. tell your son I, re I really like that line. Uh, I'm going to use it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Take care, man. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.